now it's time to talk about Kerberos. And Kerberos was based on these, on the symmetric version of the Needham Schroeder protocol. So let's return back to our setting. The problem is many-to-many -many authentication. How do you prove your identity when requesting services on a network? You have many users and you have many services. Every user has access to mail, has access to printer, has access to some databases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Think about all of the accounts that you have on the internet for different web services. This is the idea of the problem. We want something like single sign-on, SSO, where you log in with your password once, you gain access to lots and lots of services, you don't have to type in your password every single time you do anything. And clearly, if every single time you did a database query or tried to print something or access something on a website that was behind a, an authentication page, this is a usability disaster. Well, the naive solution is every server knows every user password. So every user has a password. Alice has a password. Bob has a password. Charles has a password. And then every single service that can offer any service on the network, the web server, the, the database server, the printers, they just know every single person's password. And then you do a password-based authentication. So you want to print, you authenticate with the password. Even if this wasn't enough of a, a usability nightmare, this has two flaws in addition. One, it's insecure. If you break into one server, you can compromise all users. Now, hopefully the passwords are being stored reliably, but nevertheless, if you're able to get the user to just tell you their password, because that's kind of how password authentication works, if you gain access to any one single entity on the network that receives users' passwords, then you're able to compromise every single user, right? Part of the problem is people are just sending their passwords all the time all over the network. That's not ideal. And the second is that it's inefficient. And this inefficiency, inefficiency can result in a security problem. In particular, if you want to change your password, you have to change your password on the printer, on the mail server, on the database server. You have to go to every single server. And if you miss one, that's a problem. And suppose Alice loses her job. Alice's password has to be revoked from every single service that offers her services before. Everyone needs to now know that this password should no longer be honored. And if one of these is missed, it's a security problem. And the fact that you have to do this labor-intensive effort is a usability problem that results in a security problem. So enter Kerberos. The requirements... They wanted security. They wanted security against passive eavesdroppers on the network. They wanted secure against active attacks by malicious users. They wanted transparency in the sense that users shouldn't be burdened by authentications all the time. It, it should be operating and you shouldn't know it's running, basically. A user who's using Kerberos to do things, and you very well may have used Kerberos many times without even realizing it, you Ideally, you don't notice it's there. Security that works without you noticing is the best kind of security. Because then the usability problems disappear. Now, password entering your password is fine, but you shouldn't be entering your password all the time constantly. And additionally, they wanted scalability. They wanted it to work for lots of users lots of servers. So not something that has a single point of failure that is responsible for a great amount of communication and that, you know, is fine for 10 people, but not for a thousand or a hundred thousand. They wanted it to work at scale. And they considered a variety of threats. 
user impersonations, so a malicious user with access to a physical workstation, so like an actual desk at the company, for example, pretending to be another user from that workstation. Or sending bad network addresses, imp impersonating another user by you know, tampering with the IP addresses and the actual packets being sent. Or eavesdropping on the network, tampering with the packets while they're being transmitted, replay attacks. Kerberos was designed to thwart all of these attacks. And the solution involves this trusted third party, a TTP, a trusted third party. And the idea is that every user proves their identity to the TTP and requests a ticket for service. The trusted third party knows all the users and the servers. So it's, it's like the center hub in this hub and spoke design. So everyone knows the trusted third party and the trusted third party knows everyone. The trusted third party knows who should be able to access what, you know, Alice can print, Bob can access the database, these sorts of things. Every user then gets a ticket, and the ticket is what's used to access services. In this case, the TTP acts as an authentication service. In the same way that the printer is a printing service, the TTP is an authentication service. It's providing the service of authentication so that the printer doesn't have to. It provides evidence in the form of tickets that whoever holds this ticket is allowed to print. Now, this is convenient, but it is, of course, a single point of failure, which means that such a trusted third party on a network is going to have to have a high level of physical security. In particular, you're going to want the machine that runs Kerberos to be in a room that's locked and not with not many people having the key and cameras in the room so that you can see people coming and going so that there's this kind of auditing taking place because you're putting a lot of trust in this trusted third party who is able to now manage every user's ability to authenticate with services. What are the requirements on the ticket? The ticket gives the holder access to a network service. So if you're holding a ticket, then the network service accepts it. If the ticket says, I'm allowed to print, then, and you give that ticket and the document then that document gets printed. The ticket proves that a user has already authenticated and proves that the whoever is responsible for knowing whether or not they're allowed to print, that has been already determined. The user having proven who they are and been authorized to do something has already been done, and the ticket just represents that information so that the printer doesn't need to know if Alice still works there or if Bob is allowed to print more than his, uh, if his quota has already expired, doesn't need to worry about those details. All it needs to know is that, oh, this is a valid ticket, or nope, this is not a valid ticket. As such, users should not be able to create tickets. That would be bad if the users could just make up their own tickets and they worked. But also they should not be able to delegate tickets. Alice should not be able to get a ticket to print and then give it off to Bob. Because Bob can't be trusted. We don't want the ability for tickets to be delegated. So, how do the tickets actually work? The logistics? The authentication service encrypts some information with a key known to the server, like the printer. The printer can decrypt it, but not the user. We saw this before with the Needham Schroeder protocols. There's a ticket. Alice is entrusted to deliver it to Bob, but Alice can't actually read it. So the user simply forwards the ticket, doesn't, can't create it, or at least can't reliably create it, can't read it, but the server can decrypt it and verify the information. And the contents of the ticket include everything that is necessary to prevent the abuse. So... The user using tickets for other services, so the ticket needs to name exactly who it's for. This ticket is for this printer. Or users using tickets after they lose access, for instance, if they've been fired. So this ticket is valid as of today, as of this particular day, and it's valid for three hours. 
users giving tickets to other users. This this ticket is for this IP address belonging to Alice and no one else. So the ticket includes the username, the server name, the thing providing service that is, the address of the user's workstation, and the lifetime of the ticket. So, how is this implemented? Well, there's a naive way, we'll call it naive authentication, the protocol here, the user sends the password to the authentication server, the server then provides an encrypted ticket. What's wrong with this? Well, one, if an eavesdropper sees the password being sent over the network, they can clearly impersonate them afterwards. So we're going to have to somehow encrypt the password. We can't just send the password in plain text, or the attacker would be able to then know that user's password forever. And second, we have to send the password every single time we want a ticket. I want to print, I send the password, I get a ticket, I go to the printer. Later, like a second later, one of my emails has a link to a database. I didn't want to access the database. I send my password. I get a ticket for the database. I send that to the database. This is not ideal. We don't want the user to be sending their password all the time, all the time over the network. That's not good. Ideally, they don't send the password over the network at all, but also that they, they don't need to enter their password either all the time. So the idea of Kerberos is a two-step authentication. The protocol works where first the user authenticates to the key distribution center, the KDC, the auth server it's called. So it, it first authenticates to the auth server and the auth server gives the user a special ticket, a ticket granting ticket. It's a ticket for the ticket granting service. So in the same way that we saw, for instance, with the Needham Schroeder protocol, where Alice was able to talk to Bob, in this case, what happens is Alice logs in, authenticates, proves it's Alice with the key distribution center, which gives Alice a ticket granting ticket. And that ticket proves Alice already know, is, is authenticated, proves that this person's Alice, that the password's good, and that ticket-granting ticket is then used to actually get tickets for things, like printers. So we're separating the act of authenticating with a password from the act of authorization, as in you're allowed to print. We're separating those into two distinct processes. One, you authenticate, you get a ticket-granting ticket, you then take the ticket-granting ticket to get tickets. So what are some threats to this two-step protocol? First, there's ticket hijacking. This is where a malicious user steals the service ticket, this ticket-granting ticket. They may even use it on the same workstation, so you can't rely on IP addresses or network address verification. So the server, the, the thing that provides services, the thing like the printer, it must verify that the user who gives the ticket is also the same to whom the ticket was issued. And second, there's no server authentication. Which means that if Alice has a ticket to print and gives it to the printer, Alice doesn't actually know if that's the printer. And, you know, if it's a document with sensitive information in it, we don't want that just to be delivered anywhere on the network, right? An attacker may misconfigure the network, so they receive messages that should have been going somewhere else, eavesdropping. And so we must have that the servers also prove their identity. All right, now to the actual protocol. Kerberos. The notation that we use is the following. K sub C is a long-term key for a client, Alice, a user. 
And this is derived from their password. So we'll use a, a password-based key derivation, the kind of thing that produces the hash that we end up storing if we're storing a password correctly. We'll use that, that same idea to generate a random key based on a password. And then, case of TGS, this is the long-term key of the ticket granting service known by both the KDC and the ticket granting service. Case of V, we use V for the network services, so V is like a printer. And case of V is the key that is known between the printer and the ticket granting service. So again, we have this uh, hub and spoke design. There's a center ticket granting service, whole bunch of services and the ticket granting service and the other services, they all have a one-to-one -one key in shared amongst them. And we use k sub two parameters to represent a short-term session key. So k sub c comma TGS, this would be a key between c, the client, and TGS, the ticket granting service, or k sub c comma v between c and a service v. Alice goes to her workstation and she enters in her password. Now this password is then used in a key derivation function, a uh, password-based key derivation function, such as argon2, and is used to derive a key. This idea of hashing a password over and over and over so you strengthen it and get a, a high value that is uh, harder to compute with a brute force attack on passwords. Now these keys are then used to communicate between Alice and what's called the auth server. We'll see that in a second. In the meantime, Alice stores her key in RAM. It's never written to disk. It's never sent over the network. It's only known by Alice and this workstation and the auth server. So there's an authentication server, this this key distribution center, that knows all the clients and knows all their passwords. And this can be done by, for instance, enrolling. When you join the company, part of the process of setting up your password is to set up your password with the authentication service. Now, Alice wants to print. Kerberos has this happen in three different phases. The first phase is that Alice gets a ticket to get tickets. So Alice goes to the auth service and says, hi, my name is Alice, and I'd like to talk to the ticket granting service. So the idea of Alice, the idea of the ticket granting service. And the ticket granting service, who Alice will talk to next, is the thing that provides out the tickets. The authentication service is responsible to facilitate a secure communication between Alice and the ticket granting service. The authentication service is the only entity that knows Alice's key. And so what the auth service can do is get A's password, because it has it stored, derive the corresponding key, k sub A, and then it knows both the identity of the ticket granting service and the key for the ticket granting service as well. So it replies to Alice with a message encrypted entirely with k sub a, Alice's password, that only Alice and the auth sent authentication service know. So Alice is the only one who can decrypt this message that is then sent in reply. And it consists of a session key, k a comma t g s, so the key that Alice should use to talk to the ticket granting service. It re repeats the identity of the ticket granting service. It, it says the current time as it is known to the auth service. It says its lifetime, so the, these tickets then have a, a certain amount of time to live. So this key K A comma ticket granting service that is going to expire, for instance, at the end of the day. So Alice maybe has to do this once a day. Goes to the off service, gets the day's ticket, so that they can get other tickets. And then it includes as well this ticket for the ticket granting service. And that ticket is what Alice is entrusted to pass on to the ticket granting service. So the entire message, it's all encrypted with case of A. And here I have all the different points. This is the session key that will be used. And then this ticket, this last component, ticket T TGS, this is effectively the same message, but the information that the ticket granting service needs to know. 
Alice is trusted to simply forward this on to the ticket granting service. And indeed, Alice can't tamper with it meaningfully because it's all encrypted with KTGS, which is only known by the ticket granting service and the auth service. So the authentication service is able to, with knowledge of Alice's password, prepare a message that if Alice did type the right password, Alice could derive this message. And if Alice typed the wrong password, then Alice can't derive this, un or understand this message, can't derive the key to decrypt the message. And importantly, the password is never transmitted. There's information encrypted with a key that's derived from the password, but this is a form of, of authentication that doesn't involve simply just sending a password over the network and then checking to see if they match. So the ticket for the ticket granting service has the same session key, has the identity of Alice, has the time as known by the key distribution center, KCD should be KDC. It has the lifetime as well of the ticket, the same lifetime. It has the identity of the ticket granting service, so to make sure that this is, they know that this ticket is meant for them. And it has the address of Alice, address such as an IP address or host name of the workstation that Alice happens to be working on. So Alice can't use this ticket to get services on another machine. Now, Alice can't understand this ticket. She can't decrypt it. She can't change it. She's just expected to deliver it. So Alice wants to print. So on the computer, she types line printer, LPR, and some command to send the document out to the printer. What happens next? Well, at this point, in RAM, Alice has her key, case of A, and Alice also has a shared symmetric key between Alice and the ticket granting service. And she has other stuff, the ticket as well, that she needs to send. So she wants to print. She needs K sub A V for some printer V. Some session key between Alice and a printer. But she doesn't have that yet. All she has is K A comma T G S and a ticket to send to the ticket granting service. So the next step is Alice goes to the ticket granting service and sends to the ticket granting service the name of the printer she wants to talk to and a ticket that says, here is the ticket that, you know, encodes all the information that you can trust me that this is, you know, uh, that it has the symmetric key that we should use. I've already proven that I've authenticated with the authentication service. This ticket is still valid. Uh, I, it was issued to me at some particular time and it has a lifetime of eight hours and that, you know, clearly hasn't expired yet. All of this information is encoded by the ticket uh, that is delivered from Alice to the ticket granting service. She then also adds a message for the ticket granting service containing her identity, her address, and the current time. And this is encrypted with that session key. And what this proves now is that Alice was able to decrypt that ticket. Or rather that Alice knows the information in the ticket granting ticket to the ticket granting service that particular contains the shared symmetric key k a comma t g s because alice is able to create a message that includes the current time using a session key that was generated recently by the auth service so the auth service generated a session key quite recently and includes the time, so you can confirm this, and it includes a session key, and Alice can now show that she knows this by encrypting her name and the current time and the address of the workstation she's on with this session key. Now, the ticket granting service can't decrypt this second part yet because they don't know the session key, but by examining the ticket, they can. So the ticket granting service for all the services V, so all the printers, all the things on the network, they know a key K sub V for that. In the same way that the authentication service knew for every user a K sub A, to that the, the key for each of individual user they might talk to, they know a long-term key for every single service. The ticket granting service knows a long-term key for every single service. They also know their own key, KTGS, and they can therefore decrypt the ticket. Ticket TGS because Ticket TGS is encrypted with K sub TGS so they can decrypt the ticket. Now note the first message is not encrypted because no exchange has been done. So Alice simply sends ID of V in the in clear, 
And she sends the ticket encrypted with TGS. The second thing is called an authenticator. And what this does is it proves that Alice has earlier authenticated. The being able to create this message shows that Alice was able to decrypt the message that was sent to her by the key distribution center, by the auth service, to be able to get that session key. And so this is called an authenticator. It's just a piece of information that proves that an authentication has already happened, even though it's not happening right now. The ticket granting service doesn't do authentication. It does authorization. So the ticket granting service replies with a message, all of which is encrypted with a key between Alice and the ticket granting service. So it's all encrypted with K A sub T G S, which the ticket granting service can learn by examining the ticket that only it can decrypt, as well as, of course, the authentication service, which prepared it. And in that message is included a new session key the pick bad random by the ticket granting service for Alice to talk to the printer with. It includes the identity of the printer, ID sub V, and this is included because you see at the top where ID sub V was sent, this was sent in plain text, it could have been tampered with. By including it here, Alice then knows, all right, this, this is in fact the printer that I wanted to talk to, and it's now being sent in reply encrypted with the message for the ticket granting service. And it includes the time as known by the ticket granting service and the lifetime of the of this ticket. And then finally, the ticket itself, the thing that Alice then needs to send to the printer that proves that Alice can print. So the ticket granting service gives Alice the ticket. It's a service that gives out tickets. It gives out Alice this particular ticket. And tickets, just like the ticket granting ticket, have lifetimes are timestamped when they were created, have the identity for who they were or who they are for, and a session key that can be used to communicate. So, all of this is encrypted with this session key between Alice and the ticket granting service, which the ticket granting service is able to learn by looking at their own ticket. Now, this final part, this tickets of V, its format is similar. To the other ticket, so it has a session key, it has the identity of Alice, it has the address of Alice where Alice is going to appear on the network from, it has the identity of the printer repeated, it has the time as known by the ticket granting service, and it has the lifetime of the ticket. So the time sub TGS and lifetime, these would be the same for the message that was delivered to Alice as it would be for the one encoded in the ticket. Importantly, all of this information is encrypted with the printer's long-term key, the case of V. The service V has a long-term key in the same way that users have long-term keys, and the ticket granting service knows every service's long-term key, so it can produce these tickets encrypted so that they can decrypt it. So now at this point, Alice has a ticket for the printer, it has a session key for the printer, Alice is ready to print. So, final step of the protocol. Alice wants to print, Alice has the tickets and the keys, goes to the printer, sends the ticket to the printer, and additionally sends her name, her address, and the time, all encrypted with the session key, thus proving that Alice was able to decrypt the session key that the ticket granting service provided to her and the only way she could have done that is if she could decrypt the message from the ticket granting service using a key that the authentication service provided to her. And so the printer doesn't need to know if Alice knows her password. The printer doesn't need to know Alice's password. The printer is happy just to see a ticket from the ticket granting service and trusts that the ticket granting service made sure that Alice presented a valid authenticator and it's the job of the authenticator to actually do the mess, the, some kind of communication involving Alice's password so that they know that whoever's sitting at that computer typed in Alice's password. But the printer doesn't worry about that. It's happy to just see a well-formed message from the ticket granting service and trust that the ticket granting service did its job and that the authentication service did its job as well. 
So the printer can decrypt the ticket to get the session key, can thereby decrypt the authenticator string, confirm that the IP address matches, that the time is reasonable, that the ticket the time on the ticket matches the current time that the printer thinks it is and the time that Alice thinks it is, and that uh, that the ticket is for Alice and the ID that is being provided is the ID for Alice. And at this point, reply with a message like time plus one, encrypted with the session key. Again, the idea here, we're treating time like a nonce. We're just adding one to it. We're just computing a non-trivial function. This allows the printer to prove to Alice that indeed it was able to decrypt Alice's authenticator string, get the time, add one to it, compute a non-trivial function, and re-encrypt the result, sending it back with the session key. So the printer is able to understand th what the message Alice just sent was. Computing a non-trivial function over time A proves knowledge of k sub A comma V, and thereby knowledge of k sub A case of V, rather. Printer V, by showing that they understand KAV and being able to use it to compute a non-trivial function, effectively proved that they decrypted their ticket, and their ticket was encrypted with case of V, meaning that they must be the printer that Alice wants. After this point, Alice can use case of A comma V to talk to the printer for as long as that ticket is valid. So Alice can then send her document to be printed, the printer prints it, the document will be sent encrypted over the network, so it's not that plain text documents are just being sent over a network with many thousands of people, for example, but rather Alice sends it to the printer encrypted, printer decrypts it, prints her document, and she can keep using the same ticket all day long until the time expires. So Alice has to authenticate once, get a ticket granting serve ticket, and then with a ticket granting service ticket rather with a ticket granting ticket gets individual tickets for all of the different services she'll need and if she needs to use the same service more than once she doesn't need to go back to the ticket granting service to get a, a new one she can just keep using the same old ticket as long as it's valid as long as his life hasn't expired so if you make the lifetime really long it's less burden on the ticket granting service but it comes at a cost of well Alice can abuse a ticket longer in time. For instance, if you set it to be a month, well, Alice might get fired into that month and should have that revoked, but you can't revoke these tickets. These tickets are proving that something has already happened. So if something has changed in the time since the ticket was issued, and now, that won't be reflected on the ticket. The ticket won't encode that information. The ticket just says, at some time earlier, this was true. And then includes a lifetime to basically say, don't trust this forever. At some point, make Alice get a new ticket to just make sure I can remake the same statement that this still holds. In large networks, you can also use Kerberos. And here, imagine large consisting of multiple sites, geographically dispersed. So a large company with many offices, for example. You don't want to then have one key distribution center, one auth service. You don't want everyone across an organization with hundreds of sites to all be connecting to one KDC somewhere, and that's not even on in their local network, but over the, the big scary internet instead. So for large networks, if you want to, say, for instance, allow Alice to access a database stored in another office or access a printer for some reason in another office... What happens is the network is divided into realms. And key distribution centers in different realms have different key databases. So the key distribution center, say at the Frankfurt office, won't know about any users in the Paris office. They won't have their passwords. The users don't have to register with every single KDC in every single office. Instead, users have a home realm ticket granting service and a home realm key distribution center. So each user has a, a home, and that home knows their password. So the first thing you do if you want to access a service in another realm, you get 
a ticket for your home realm's ticket granting service from your home realm's key distribution center. So step one works the same. Alice logs in, types her password, gets a ticket granting ticket for her ticket granting service. And home realm just means, like in a sense, the one that she uses to do things. If under normal Kerberos, home realm KDC, home realm TGS, home realm printer. But the next step is different. Then Alice gets a ticket for a remote realm ticket granting service from a home realm ticket granting service. So she takes her ticket granting ticket and instead of saying, I want a ticket to print, says, I want a ticket to get a ticket granting ticket from another ticket granting service. So she goes to the Frankfurt office, ticket granting service, if that's her home realm, and says, I would like to pr- I would like to appear to be a user at the Paris office ticket granting service. And so now we have the case that the home realm TGS and the remote realm TGS have to know each other. But that's much easier than every single remote realm KDC knowing every single user. Now, if you have 100 offices, you just have all of their ticket granting services know each other. And so then it's possible that Alice goes to her home realm ticket granting service and says, I'd like a ticket for the remote realm ticket granting service. At this point, Alice now has a a ticket for a remote realm ticket granting service. It works just like the final step two steps of Kerberos. She goes to that that remote realm ticket granting service says, I'd like a ticket to print on some remote realm printer, gets a a ticket for to print, and then uses that to print. Or to access whatever service is necessary. So this concludes Kerberos. I just want to highlight some of the important ideas in Kerberos and its design and why it's interesting and and still worth studying long and still used in fact it does make use of these session keys so we have these long-term secrets but they're only used to derive short-term session keys that are actually used to communicate so documents to be printed are never sent with long-term keys they're only ever sent with short-term keys And you separate session keys for every single user server pair. So every time Alice, a user Alice and a printer Bob talk to each other, they're going to have a separate session key. So every single pair of communicating entities will ultimately do it with these session keys. And the long-term keys are just used to deliver messages such as tickets that include these session keys. It uses symmetric crypto only, so it's fast, there's no expensive operations, there's no slow operations. This would matter more in the time then Kerberos was being developed and deployed, then it wouldn't matter now. Now we we can do public key cryptography. It's still slow, but on today's computers, it's not painfully slow that we would have to worry about whether we can afford to do it for every single kind of communication, like every single time we want to print something. Now it's less of a, of a factor, but of course, at the t- time of the design, this was a, an important consideration. And finally... There's this idea of this trusted third party. That the hard part of that needs to be solved, which is managing how all of these different community co- entities are communicating, is solved by having a trusted third party, the key distribution center, and the ticket granting service serve as a liaison. The ticket granting service knows all of the services, like printers, and the authentication service knows all the users. And so now we have a, if we imagine it as a graph, we have all of the users having a direct relationship with the auth server, the auth server having a direct relationship with the ticket granting service, and the ticket granting service having a direct relation with every single service. 
at least for single realm Kerberos. And so when Alice wants to talk to a printer, you can visualize a path through this graph going through two intermediate hops along the way. It separates out the authentication from the authorization, and it has proof of identity based on these authenticator strings. So Alice doesn't need to authenticate every single time. Alice doesn't need to give her password to the printer every single time she wants to print. She does it once, gets an authenticator string, and then uses that authenticator string to do to prove that it's already been done. Timestamps are included in all the messages. This helps prevent against replay attacks. It requires that clocks are cl kept synchronized, but even still, you can have rough synchronicity between the clocks. It doesn't have to have the exact time for this to work because tickets have lifetime, so you might be a few minutes off, but it'll still work. And the server learns about the services learn about the keys from reading these tickets. This idea that it's Alice's job to deliver these tickets to them. <laughs>